So the state of Medic AI. <coughs> I think my presenter just grabbed me at the time, just want to refresh our mind about what's happening today. It's just really impressive. So today it takes one minute to generate all the data the entire human civilization generated before the year 2003. And 10 years ago, only 10% of medical records on computer. Today is 90% or even more. And the cost of sequencing the human genome was a lot of money, which was sufficient to buy uh, Boeing 737. We become become by two seven thirty seven max because of the crashes. So the price would probably drop, I guess. Are they on sale? We can buy four. <laughs> and every, so today there are more cell phones on Earth than the population of Earth. So that's the kind of thing we have. And uh, uh, today, if you get actually Houston is the first site for commercial five G. The first user is from uh, Verizon somewhere in Houston. I think not too far away from here. So with 5G, uh, it only takes five seconds to download a high definition Harry Potter movie. And with your 4G today, uh, 30 minutes, if you still use 3G, you're out of luck, 24 hours. <laughs> you have to wait for tomorrow to watch the movie, right? And uh, also company power, what every you have in your pocket is probably 10 times faster than the biggest supercomputer in 75, the Cray, whatever, in which would you to do weather forecasting, the rocket design, all of this. Okay, so you have a lot of company power to do. And again, this graph I showed many times. As you can see that information technology has disrupted many, many major industries, except healthcare, but it's happening now. That's why the rest of my, my presentation we focus on, like communication, uh, information retrieval, travel, whatever, and actually the biggest companies uh, in terms of market cap in these industries are all IT companies now, including taxi. The Uber is the biggest taxi company, which does not actually own any taxi fleet yet, okay? And you can see that actually Netflix is the biggest movie theater, which does not have any physical property. Okay, let's keep going. This is a very interesting graph because to what's happening today is very different. So there are many, many so-called AI revolution in the history of the past 70 years. Since the beginning of the AI term invented by John Barkasi in 1956 at a conference in, uh, at um, Dartmouth. There are many, many promises and nothing happened, nothing happened, nothing happened. There was a good, very good breakthrough in 1986, which is something I personally witnessed because I was a student over there. When David Rumhardt, uh, working with Jeff Hinton and uh, Williams, uh, they actually discovered back propagation, which is the most important algorithm for deep learning. But unfortunately, at that time, there were, no, there were not much data, no company power, you can only solve some, some toy problem. So actually I learned that, I, I was even a TA for this course, and I gave up this because my primary advisor said, if you go to this field, you will never get a job. It was true. <laughs> for 20 some years, nothing really happened, okay? Even I did that, nothing happened, okay? But, okay, so there, uh, last, after that, you have all the uh, so-called breakthrough like uh, Chess, uh, Deep Blue, and uh, Watson, which are not really the smart machines yet, until AlphaGo, which is very impressive. Okay, before that, there are major event. Uh, it's my story. In 2012, there is a challenge using the ImageNet for image recognition. So, uh, Fifi Lee was a assistant professor at Princeton. She decided to collect all the imaging data and annotate all of them, probably up to meaning, whatever. Made the data public available for people to do whatever they want. So, Jeff Hinton, Finally got the data set with the company power. His team did a, a job which was much better than the rest of the competition team. And he used deep learning. So that's the beginning of the popularity of deep learning. And after that, AlphaGo basically beat the best human player. Even worse, Alpha Zero. Okay, as a next generation of AlphaGo, which did not actually learn anything from human, it played against itself. 
and beat all human players over there. So that's scary. So after that, all the rest is history. I think you all know what's happening today. So that's where uh, we are uh, here, and uh, we talk about the things that are happening. But before that, I want to mention one thing. That's why the reason today is so special is because you look at the entire human history, economic revolutions. The first major one, which is very important for humankind, is the agricultural revolution. Before, that's about 10,000 years ago, before that, when you're hungry, you go out for hunting or get some food. You could die if you cannot find any, right? So farming was started about 10,000 years ago. With farming, you can control what you want to grow, what you have, you can store everything together. So humankind could survive. That's the biggest revolution for humankind for survival. Then the, the Industrial Revolution in the 1600s, starting there, everything like engines, electricity, whatever. Actually, there are four different uh, Industrial Revolutions over there, whatever you call. That's basically for the physical labor. Okay, like you can fly, you can drive, you can do whatever you could not do physically by human body. Today, we are experiencing the cognitive revolution, which is brought by AI and the cognitive labor they bring, what it can do, it could not do before. So it's going to be very, very significant. So you should be happy you are in this field. I don't think we have a problem finding a job if you do good at school. And uh, every place looking for people with training in this area. Okay, so I want to play some videos here to show you what the why sound AI is so real now because it solved many many real world problems which were not solvable over the past 770 years of AI. Okay. <clears throat> This is the state of the school presentation for the School of Biomedical Informatics at the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston. So this is my speech using Google Assistant. You can do that on your phone. As you can see that the beauty is that the Google predicts what I was going to say. It could be wrong. It could recognize the wrong word. But together, you get real-time feedback and with all the learning over there, it got to be correct 100%. That's why I told you I have a Google accent. Because only Google can understand me one at a time. Seriously, and nobody else can, okay? So today's uh, speech recognition, actually by industry standard, machines are better than human because machine can achieve 98%-ish. The best human on average is about 95%. So machines are already better than people for understanding speech. Okay, so the next one, you have seen this before. Some of you just want to reshow this one, see why it's so impressive. This self-driving car, that's the behind the scenes images. It's about image processing. Imaging processing is very hard, has been very hard until a few years back. Okay, suddenly the problem was kind of solved for, for some routine organized stuff. So this is based on visual, video image, and the radar image, and GPS. So this is real-time computing with uh, NVIDIA GPU. So this is the high-definition map. It does the planning competition. A lot of these are training on simulated uh, things. So the bike can be recognized by the car before open the door, the door will not open. And recognize license plate, that's scaring, okay, in real time. Ca ca catch all of this. That's already happening in Houston. Yes. And recognize the driver, open the doors automatically, even start engine V1. So. So that's the demo by NVIDIA at a consumer electronic show last year. It's pretty impressive. I mean, it's real. It's, it's more than real. And Lex, it's in Houston now. Just the two weeks ago, the Kroger on Buffalo Speedway at 59 started to deliver 
food, groceries to your home with drop in cars, right here. So if you, anyone who wants to try all the something you deliver here, we should all get picture videos over there. <laughs> Whoever got the first one, we get an award from the school, okay? <laughs> try it out, okay? I, don't, I have not tried it yet, but it's, from the news, it's real, but as it is, at this time, a person still sits there inside the car. The car will drop itself, and you say what happened, but it's, it's coming. Okay, so next one is the robotics is also very hard. This is still a very hard problem. A lot of robotic problems have not been solved, but advanced has been amazing. So here is a video of the robot by Boston uh, Dynamics. The most surprising part is that the robot learned a lot of things by itself, okay, without any, just explore the environment, like a baby crawling on the, whatever, eventually learn everything in the environment. That's pretty impressive, right? <laughs> I can never do that in my lifetime. <laughs> Don't count on me, okay? <laughs> Okay, so that's robot. Okay, so what about creativity, you may ask? All of these are like a boring task, right? Let's see if my machine can do take over. But now it's more getting more interesting and potentially scary. Okay, let me put this one, and then we can talk about what do we have. So basically it's a drawing program, art. You can do whatever, you can draw a waterfall, it's going to get it there for you. You can draw a sketch, get a rock over there. So let the rock, you draw something, then it's going to get a rock for you. From millions of images it had learned. If we have You can do like mirror image of the water, it can do that for you. Or if we change the ground to be covered in snow. Changing the, the ground to snow, then the sky will change it too, according to the sky, which is appropriate for snow, right? designers, people making virtual worlds to train robots and self-driving cars. So, it can create things. But even more interesting is that actually the AI created painting. Uh, last year was auctioned for about $400,000. So someone was willing to pay this much for AI created painting. Yeah, I, I'm gonna pay for that. Okay, but some people. <laughs> Well, again, so which means some creativity part is getting there, and if you look at some other field like uh, AI creating poems, there are some very good poems I could never create in my lifetime again. Very creative, uh, very nice. Okay, so uh, AI is everywhere, it's just taking off, and we are still 2019. And by 2030, uh, estimated by PwC, is that AI is going to contribute 15% of global GDP. So basically, pretty much every industry, everything in people's lives will be touched, if not totally transformed by AI. So for healthcare, that's why we are here today. So there are a lot of things we can do. Uh, McKinsey also had uh, research on the potential impact. Uh, you can see there are many things that can be done, but uh, this is a short list. There are a lot of more things. I'm gonna cover, I'm gonna pick some uh, cases, example, to show you what AI has done already in medicine and healthcare. The first one, imaging. Imaging is one of the first that generates some very good results. And this is a paper two, more than two years ago now uh, by Google and Stanford. They basically developed an imaging recognition program for the skin and could diagnose all the skin conditions, including cancer. And traditionally, if you are training as a human, you learn the thing on the right, different kind, you have to review a lot of things to learn, to categorize. So the performance of machine was equal or better than trained dermatologist. Okay, so this program has been used in some places, especially for the initial diagnosis and uh, referral. If you have something bad, you say, what well, should say uh, a dermatologist? That's, that's where you can get help. 
And for the uh, record image, which is another simple one, and which has, it has seen a lot of advance over there. So this is actually a real product, just released last week by DeepMind, which is a division of Google. They had an algorithm developed a long time ago, I mean a year ago, a long time ago. Finally, they're building uh, this physical machine actually to use algorithm to give suggestions and uh, referrals. And it can, it's based on the 3D image of the retina can diagnose basic things, eye problem uh, coming from diabetes or uh, glaucoma and uh, some other uh, basic condition over there. So it's 30, 30 seconds, get an image of the machine, it's not cheap, it's a few thousand dollars, but it, a clinic can afford. You take an image, then do some initial analysis, then refer the patient to any place that he or she needs. Then there are other x-rays, a lot of application area. I mean, the machines are doing a very good job. And so here's something that are happening in our school. So uh, Luca has done a lot of things here. I picked one here. So for stroke, uh, one type of stroke is the blockage of the blood vessel by blood clot. And if it's identified early, treated early, the patients can survive. Can outcomes are very good. But there is a trick of there. Not every patient is eligible for this procedure. It's called uh, they're using the, the stent procedure to remove the clot from the brain. So basically insert the needle from your, your groin here on the leg all the way to your brain and use the stand remover to remove the clot. This can only be done for certain patients, not everyone. So in order to see whether the patient is eligible or not, you have to do a lot of things. So typical uh, technology available to most smaller clinics who cannot do procedure, a CT, uh, CT scan. So you use this CT angiogram, and Lucas team developed an uh, algorithm that can actually make suggestions see whether the patient is eligible or not. So make it simple. But ask Luca for all technical details over there. It's not trivial. It's pretty hard. But so there's a potential thing that you can apply. So they are doing this. And at our member Herman Clinic test working with the uh, two you know, the physicians in the medical school. And the drug discovery, again, is a very expensive process, and the drug repurposing is always something we want. So this is the one I presented many times. I will do it again in case you do not know. So Dr. Xu's study on metformin. Uh, this is a study that looks into millions of patient records, identify cancer patients who are diabetic or not, and the drugs they use for diabetes. And the discovery was that metformin had some magic cancer-fighting function. So the, pick, the cancer patients who are diabetic and take metformin, their five years survival rate is much higher, much better than the controls. Okay, even the kind of patients who are not diabetic. Actually, I just learned that uh, from the MU Summit last week in San Francisco, I heard that metformin is now the second most popular drug after marijuana. <laughs> Taken by people who are not diabetic. The, especially the tech people, the investors, they are rich and famous, they want to live forever. So metformin is kind of a longevity drug for them. So they think they can prolong their life, whatever, I'm not sure that clinical trials have been done, but that's what's happening. So this kind of thing potentially can do for many existing drugs which are there uh, or the, whose patent has expired, it can do a lot of things. And now even more interesting, this is another recent study by uh, Google again, uh, the DeepMind team. They developed a new uh, system called AlphaFold to predict the three-dimensional protein structure from the, the one-dimension sequence. This is a very hard problem. If you are a biologist, you know this. And actually, there is uh, some kind of paradox identified by this researcher in the 1960s. If you want to look at all the possibilities of the, the small, small molecules for the peptide and to predict the 3D structure, it will take the entire life of the universe to get it down. But apparently the biological system can do that in a body, magically, real time. So, but again, they try to develop this sequence with deep learning. Their performance at the last, uh, some challenge over there, I forgot exactly this, uh, against the real human scientist. And the machine's performance was more than 60, 70% correct on the 
the samples given to them, I think the best human player did like 10, 20%. So machines are much better, so that's another potential big area for potentially drug uh, design and, and uh, uh, drug design. Okay, so this is getting real now. Uh, the idea is that we have all the record mineral records of there to analyze all of them, identify some patterns. One individual patient goes to clinic, the patient record match to the big data over there, then returns something just specific for the patient for either diagnosis, prevention, or treatment. Okay? And this one is as real and to some extent that is there is a live demo by IBM Watson. Watson has a reputation of almost promising, but for this one, I was there, I played with it. It's pretty impressive. So basically get a basic uh, patient records of there, get some return on suggested things that the physician can do, then they decide what to do. So this one getting pretty good now. Okay, this is why I showed many times, basically with all the data for many years, you can see the degrees progression. So this is the interesting information that it can use for all kinds of things, especially for the prediction of the, the path of medical problems down the road. Okay, so one of them is the, the machine generated calculators for some risks. The one that, uh, that was, so if you are in cardiology, what have you heard of that is there's a, a famous uh, Framingham study which started in the 1940s. Started with several thousand people, followed up many times for the past 70 years. And out of that, there was a calculator for heart attack risk. So basically, it's, it's here. Now, it's, it looks like this, okay? You have the six or seven variables your age, your gender, whether you're hypertension, get treated or not, diabetes, your um, cholesterol, whatever. So with that calculator, you can predict, I mean, in this case, this is a very sick patient. Within 10 years, this patient will die with 50% chance. So with the control, other one, if you reverse everything for the seven variables, this person can only has 7% chance of dying from heart attack, okay? So this is a very laborious study, very expensive, and it does not cover all the variables. So a team at UK, they used the UK buyback data. So they redid the whole thing with machine learning, and the performance of the machine learning was better than the one the calculator by a AHA, and also they discover different variables which contribute to patient death. So that's the kind of potential there. You can discover other things which may be relevant but were not included in the study. Identify that by human. So this team uh, got crazy again, just started a computer study, uh, just published a lot of paper uh, two weeks ago, one week ago. So this is a study, it got a press everywhere, but you look at the papers, and it's not that, it's, it's good study, but it's not as big as it claimed. They claimed that it could predict precise death time, premature deaths of patients based on data here. <laughs> You look at the different things over there, they use, compare different models. You can see that different factors are identified as the major contributors to patient death. But again, with the data over there, this, it definitely has potential. You can build all kind of calculators to, for many different medical conditions. Yeah. Okay, another one is sepsis. Sepsis is the bloodstream infection in the hospital, and it's leading cause of death in U.S. hospitals. Uh, basically, one patient dies every two minutes in the U.S., and more than cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, HIV combined. So it's a big uh, number of there. And the mortality increases 8% for every hour that treatment was delayed. So potentially 80% of sepsis deaths could be prevented if you discover that early. Uh, there is a clinical trial by UCSF team, uh, uh, AI-based learning for the detection of early detection of sepsis. So they actually implement my system in the real setting in ICU, and uh, they discover, I mean, they found that with this system, the mortality rate was reduced from 21% to 9%, which is quite impressive. So in our school, we have um, UT Health. 
So Dr. Chang working with Bob Murphy and uh, Peter Patel. So we're trying to do something with all ICU, and we use the uh, mimic data, the data for some initial work. They actually could do a very nice job. So we are going to see whether we can get a similar performance in the real data from Emma Herman. And with this kind of uh, learning, and we did a few step study. It was basically detection, early detection. Okay, it's even better if you could predict four hours ahead of time this patient might get sepsis. That's even better. So what uh, Shaw Chan's team worked on is to do the early prediction several hours ahead of time. So far, the performance is pretty good. Like uh, the AUC is about 0.9 compared with the standard best one over there, the 0.85. So there are a lot of potentials over there, so they're actually working on that, get RB, if only RB goes through. RB is always the biggest problem, a barrier for anything. Okay, then we have a lot of sensors, uh, all kind of things. Uh, I think you all have one or more over there, they can do all kind of things over there. So what are the use of our consumer products? Okay, let me show you one here. So that's the Apple Watch. Now if you have the latest Apple Watch, you can actually do the EKG. So this is me, okay, no HIPAA concern. I authorize all of you to see my EKG, okay, no problem. <laughs> but if you do want to publish, let me know. So you can do the, the takes 30 seconds. Uh, only one function was released, but more are in the development. So you can detect FIB, whether you have that or not. And you can see that actually I was happy that I did not have one. So as you can see that, does not show any signs of FIB over there. Uh, two weeks ago now, I was counting one week because everything happened in real time. That's why AI is going so fast. Uh, Stanford, Apple, they had a study with more than 400,000 volunteers using their Apple Watch, the new Apple Watch. It was published like uh, two weeks ago. Uh, so among the 400 some thousand volunteers, about 0.5 of them received a positive response of, of FIB. And they actually, once they get that, they get to the real EKG with the real machine device, okay, to see whether it's real. It's actually not too bad, 71% of the ones who received positive alert from the watch were actually positive on the heavy duty medical grade EKG machines. So that's not too bad. And 57% of them actually want to see a doctor, see what's going on. But I talked to a lot of cardiologists, nobody wanted this. Because they're gonna see a lot of patients who come into them, you know, they want this, basically the people at the risk are the people who have the, I mean, the people at the risk should have this, like the heart failure patient, other patients. Yeah, for a lot more people, everybody here, I don't know. I don't know it's gonna help, but it's, we, we're all gonna see, but this is the very beginning, which means that consumer grade device can do a lot of things. And also remember that I actually had a previous version of the EKG on my watch band by a different company, a spin-off from Google called Cardio. I paid $200 for the band plus $10 subscription every month. So this company now is officially dead because Apple made this one free. You don't have to buy the band, don't have to pay the service. So that's kind of danger for startups. If you have a product, make sure that Google and Apple will never do the same thing. Otherwise, <laughs> okay, just a warning. Okay, so now with heart rate, even simpler, it's, it's less than EKG. Heart rate with all your devices over there, you can do a lot of interesting stuff. So this is the paper at IEEE conference last year. You can see that for different exercise, like running or hockey, you have different patterns of heart rate. And actually, I did the second one. Your sleep heart rate, deep sleep, shadow sleep. If you sleep without having one before bed and then, and a slave with a glass of wine, the patterns are different, okay? I did that myself, it was real for me. So you can try that. And for emotions, you can see that I did not know that. During rush hour, your heart rate could do 130, 130, pretty high. And also, if you do interview for our faculty position or student, keep a watch over there, your heart rate will jump. And for many conditions, of course, you can see the different patterns over there. 
Okay, another study by Luca. Luca, I will start here, so. Okay. Uh, I, I picked randomly, but uh, I think we'll have Matt stop here. So there's a lot of things using the device, like a uh, consumer grade thing, like typing or the motion you, uh, you do on the screen. And because uh, Parkinson's disease patients have some motor function problems, so with the subtle, the subtle thing cannot easily detect by people by condition in early stage, especially. So Lucas uh, program can actually analyze the typing patterns or the way you use your smartphone on a screen. You, you can see the difference between Parkinson's patients and the controls. It's pretty clear up there. So they are looking for some potential expansion of this study. And population health is obviously important. With that data, what do you do for the population? So we have a team here, uh, uh, Bernd Stan here, Kevin Huang, Todd Johnson, they worked on a clinical chronic disease registry and Susan team on the technical, I mean, all of this. You can see that you can manage the population as a whole to track the patients who have risk. In this one, you have the, the two blood pressures over there. The upper right one is the group patient. You should pay attention because there are blood pressures are not normal. If you click on that, it shows the history of blood pressure of one patient, which is over there. Then you can intervene. So call the patient, email the patient, whatever I say. Take your medicine or come to clinic or whatever. So that's kind of the population health before the end of the ER. Okay, precision medicine, of, of, of course, that's using the genomics with clinical things, and uh, we have the best collaboration team ever, husband and, husband and wife. Mm -hmm. Emory Bernstein, I found Merrick Bernstein, from Andy Anderson. They are collaborating on developing a close to real time patient matching. Uh, for cancer patient, the hard, one of the hardest job is to see whether this patient is eligible for hundreds of clinical trial, which are ongoing at MD Anderson. So you can speed up the process, the patient will benefit dramatically. So they are working on this one. I don't know where it is, but it's getting close. It's, it's getting getting better. And of course, we have the Center of Precision Health led by Dr. Zhao. We are doing all kind of precision medicine, genomics, all of this. And the, the machine should be here filming. The machine should be here in two That's weeks. Right. Okay, we are gonna have a sequencing machine. <laughs> Anybody I'd volunteer to take your genome sequence over there? Maybe you can get a small discount, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, now medical education. So this, I think, is old news, but it's pretty interesting, especially if you are in the medical education. So this is a robot developed by a Chinese company, iFlyTech. The, there's a robot took the, the real medical license exam at the same time with the medical school students. Okay, together. And 600 questions, 600 points. It took uh, six hours to finish for a human. The machine spent about 10 minutes to finish the whole thing. And the performance is that the machine is among the top 5%. Passed the exam. And not a pass, we are among the top 5%. But there are one problem there. So the machines did not do well for questions like ethics, non-medical stuff. <laughs> like RB or HIPAA, or whatever machines. Yeah, what is that? <laughs> All medical domain problems, they have no problem. So they did well. And the questions are not simply memories. It's, it requires some reasoning. So machines are real and doing something good here. Okay, so now let me finish with one more thing here. So this is a presentation I gave about seven years ago uh, about the future of EHR, and it was kind of real, but not real, but today it is real. I just want to revisit this, everything here, <laughs> and it's happening, so I don't know when our community will get it, but at least the products are there now. Two years from now. <laughs> uh, two years times ten, maybe. Two, two years, it's always two years. <laughs> in two years, it'll be two years. Okay, so imagine that you walked into your outpatient clinic, right? So, my getting the camera on the wall, we recognize you, your face recognition. You're automatically registered. Your documents opened, and uh, the nurses are notified. You're here, okay. When you get to the, uh, so basically that's what we're getting. So when you step the window, everything is already there. So in this specific case, I made up a story about this patient. So this patient was diabetic, and uh, he was on a trip for a week and forgot to take his medication, say metformin. And uh, his medicine was in a smart container. Every time I take one, 
it, it retract, uh, sent to the uh, clinic. So the, actually the, uh, the nurse said, looks like you did not take your medication for one week. What happened? He said, no, I took the trigger, forgot my bottle. I did get some drugs from the, the local store, so I was fine. So okay, that's fine. And I checked in everything for the iPad or whatever. And then when he walks to the exam room, his weight is measured automatically on the floor by scale. And then the temperature can be measured measured by infrared camera. Can actually actually the drill can detect your, your body temperature and your height can be measured too. So because the video image processing is pretty good now. And uh, when you open the door, the handle is a blood pressure monitor. You can get a blood pressure monitor. So basically, before you get to the room, everything, body sound are measured automatically over there. So this is the hardest one, but it's real now, so speech recognition. Nobody wants to see the doctor working on a computer without talking to the patient, right? In this case, it's all based on speech. So when a patient walks into the exam room, only talk to patient, patient talk, the doctor talk, they talk to each other, and all of this. So magically, so this is happening actually the two real demos. One is this from Microsoft. The, the other one which is better is by uh, Nuance at Hims. This past Hims like, a, like two months ago. So this is the one from Microsoft. I could not get a picture from Nuance because it kept everything secret. I could not take a picture. But in this case, the, the mic picks up the speech from the patient and doctor separates them, no problem. And the transcription from speech to text was at least a demo, a live demo, 100%. Okay, then after that, the machine got the free text into the EHR, get them organized into problems, the medication, the history, whatever. Then further process some terms into convert them into, say, ICD-9 drug code or whatever automatically. So that we make a lot of doctors happy. So, but uh, at the demo over there, it was cool. But I don't know how many cases have trained this for, so we do not know. But, but at least the technology is there. So when I get there, everything transcribed, and uh, so because this patient was diabetic, so there was a new product called a smart underwear. You can wear it that can track all your vital signs, including, including your, your glucose. So the doctor recommends this patient maybe don't have to monitor do the study blood thing every day, and uh, they have to track it in real time. And because uh, diabetes typically leads to some eye problems, so he gets the education of a patient about uh, my exam and all this one, he finishes, touch the screen, sign, it's done. Okay, so that, that's beautiful. But again, it's, uh, it's today's real, I think the package is real now. So I do not know how much it cost and why they're gonna to come to Houston, so we will see. Maybe some of you can do some start out company here to make this happen. Okay, to summarize, again, machines can do all kinds of things, but at the end, I will not let a machine to operate on me, never, okay? I will ask machine to help, maybe, and the doctor help, but I do not want a machine to touch me. So it's still the human at the end who will make decisions. But if you look at this, technology and data are growing exponentially, but the human brain never, never grows in the biological time. Your cognitive capacity does not really increase. Okay, you can make it smarter by pattern recognition, but it's there, so that's why machine technology can drive a lot of growth in this area. Okay, thank you. <laughs>